In May 2020, a general cargo vessel anchored in the lower Mississippi River dragged anchor and smashed into the bulk carrier astern of her before then running headlong into a chemical dock downriver. In a short space of time, she had managed to cause over $16 million worth of damage and put herself out of action for weeks while she went to dry dock for repairs. But what went wrong and how did it happen? On the 8th of May 2020, the general cargo vessel Nomadic Milled completed loading her cargo of lead concentrate in New Orleans on the Mississippi River. She is a geared cargo vessel approximately 138 metres in length and on that occasion loaded to an even keel draft of around 8 metres. At 13.20 that afternoon, she boarded her pilot and set off on the short passage upriver to Kennebend Anchorage where she was planning on undertaking a cargo hatch repair the following morning. The anchorage itself is on the south side of the river, away from the worst of the current which tends to be in the main channel on the northern side of the bend. The pilot chose a position in line with the other vessels at anchor, keeping the milled clear of the main traffic flow but also far enough from the bank to allow the occasional tugs and toes that would run up the inshore route where there was less current. Their plan was to anchor using an open moor, which is an effective anchoring technique using two anchors to restrict your vessel's movement. It works in areas where you can expect the current or weather to come from a consistent direction, but it relies on spreading both anchors ahead of you at a relatively narrow angle. Of course, as you narrow the angle between the anchors, you will increase your holding power but reduce the restriction that it provides to your swinging circle. Make them wider and you'll reduce your swinging circle, but you'll actually have less holding power. Anyway, they approached their anchoring position and let go the starboard anchor at 15.15 before manoeuvring across and letting go the port anchor five minutes later. To even them up, they heaved on the starboard cable and paid out the port one until they had approximately 100 metres of anchor chain on the starboard side and 80 metres on the port side. By 15.32, the bosun reported the starboard cable right ahead short stay and the port one a beam long stay. With that, the pilot was happy that the ship looked good so he left the bridge 10 minutes later, advising the master to keep the engines on standby due to the expected weather and current. The thing is, in their rush to get finished up, no one had noticed that Nomadic Mill's anchor was already dragging. As the pilot launch left the ship, she was 200 metres from the spot where they'd dropped the starboard anchor but with only 100 metres of chain out, it must have already moved. The bridge team, however, had taken the pilot at his word that all was good, so the master handed over to the second officer and left the bridge himself at 15.43. The second officer then set the anchor watch on the Ectis at 180 metres and began monitoring the ship's position. From her initial heading of 264 degrees, she started swinging to starboard with the current along the hull driving her ahead and out into that direction. When the chief officer came to take over the watch a few minutes later, she had moved out so far that he questioned her position relative to the anchor watch on the chart. Rather than investigate further, however, he simply acknowledged that he was unfamiliar with the Ectis and left it at that. Astern of the nomadic milled, the Atlantic Venus had been watching their new anchorage neighbour closely. She's a 180 metre bulker, making her larger than the milled, but as she was in ballast, she was drawing a couple of metres less. By 1613, she was beginning to get concerned, so radioed the nomadic milled requesting that they monitor their position. By now, the milled had closed to around 100 metres, so her concern was quite justified. Not long after that, nomadic milled's bow began to swing to port again. The weight had obviously come back onto the port anchor, pulling the bow around and crabbing her sideways back across the bow of the Atlantic Venus. The proximity of the swing prompted the second VHF call from the Venus, this time stating that the milled was too close and their position was unsafe. As she neared the port extreme of the swing, the weight came back onto the starboard anchor, turning her bow to starboard and swinging her back across the bow of the Atlantic Venus. Finally, it became clear to everyone that milled was dragging anchor and was closing on the Atlantic Venus. They radioed VTS to request a pilot to change position, but were instead told to contact their agent to arrange a booking. In the meantime, they brought the main engine and thrusters back online in preparation for shifting themselves. Two minutes later, they got another call from VTS on the radio. It looks like you're dragging anchor or manoeuvring. Make sure you do not raise your anchors. Maneuver with your engines to stay safe, but do not raise your anchors. Do not raise your anchors. Wait for a pilot. Nomadic Mild responded, We are waiting for a pilot. We need a pilot. We are not heaving our anchors. We just start our main engine and wait for the pilot. Five minutes later, at 16.52, the starboard swing eased and Nomadic Mills started to swing back to port. The master called the ship's agent and said they were in a very dangerous situation and needed a pilot as soon as possible. Disappointingly, the agent informed them that a pilot wouldn't be available for two or three hours. 
The master did the best he could to control the ship using her engines and thrusters, but it was to no avail. With the anchors still out, she was next to impossible to control. As a final attempt, they opened the brakes on the anchors in the hope that slackening the cables might give them a chance. Even with that though, they just couldn't turn their bow away from the Atlantic Venus. At 1655, Nomadic Mild's port side collided with the bulbous bow of the Atlantic Venus. The additional force now on Venus's anchors was too much to keep them in position, so both vessels then started closing on the south side of the river, heading towards the chemical terminal around 200 metres away. VTS then put out a call for any available tugs to proceed to the anchorage to assist. Within half an hour, the first tug was on the scene working to stabilise the two vessels. 30 minutes later, so an hour after the collision, two rush pilots arrived and boarded the two ships. Their plan was to wait for some larger tractor tugs, which were around an hour away to assist with separating the vessels. When the first one arrived on scene, they took up position on Nomadic Mild's port bow, but at that moment, Mild's pilot noticed that they were starting to move ahead, sliding across the bow of the Venus. He ordered more astern propulsion, but as soon as it came on, there was an almighty vibration felt throughout the ship, followed by multiple machinery automation alarms. Nomadic Mild's forward speed started to increase and continued to increase, even after setting the telegraphs full astern, leaving them with no option but to activate the emergency engine shutdown. As Mild continued to run ahead across Atlantic Venus's bow, the master used the rudder to turn to port in an attempt to keep the stern clear before quickly altering course to starboard to avoid hitting the centre of the chemical terminal which contained the bulk of the terminal's piping. At 1858, Nomadic Mild struck the upriver section of the chemical terminal at six knots before finally grounding on the bank. Damage to Nomadic Mild ran to an estimated $6 million, which included the loss of the starboard anchor, a 25-foot gash on the port side from contact with the terminal, fractured shell plating from contact with the Atlantic Venus's bulbous bow, multiple anchor chain abrasion marks on the bow and in the vicinity of the propeller, and numerous indentations and fragments missing from each propeller blade. Atlantic Venus's damage was less serious, running to only around half a million dollars. She lost her starboard anchor with nine and a half shackles of chain and received damage to shell plating around the bulbous bow. Additionally, the anchor chain that remained showed deep scratches and rotational indentations on a number of links. The chemical terminal, however, needed almost $11 million worth of repairs with damaged pipeline systems, walkways and associated structures. So what went wrong and how can we learn from what happened? Well, in my view, it's the same as practically every other maritime accident. There was no single point of failure, but rather a series of missed opportunities to avert the accident. Firstly, the anchorage itself. Was it really a good decision to anchor so close to another vessel in an anchorage where four to five knots of current was expected? I don't know the area myself, but right off the bat, they chose what seems to have been quite a high risk location given the prevailing conditions. Given that they did choose that exact position though, was an open moor the best choice? I can understand it being used to increase the holding power rather than reduce the swinging circle, but if that was the intention, then the anchors were dropped quite far apart, considering the length of cable that was eventually paid out. The scope and positions of the anchors would have actually given them less holding power together than a single anchor would have provided, simply due to the angle between them. Either way, that's the anchoring method they chose, so the next opportunity to stop the chain of events came when they all believed the ship was safely anchored. Everyone was in such a rush to finish that none of them realised Nomadic Mild was already dragging. It should have been immediately obvious with around 100 metres of chain on the starboard anchor, but the anchor dropped position over 200 metres away. A few minutes later, at the watch handover, the dragging was almost caught when the chief officer noticed the ship wasn't in the centre of her anchor circle anymore, but they didn't investigate further. Again, it would have been an ideal opportunity to spot that she was already dragging. Next, during her swings from side to side, it should have been apparent that something was wrong. Anything other than head to current exerts an unnecessarily high force on the anchor, increasing the likelihood of dragging. The fact that she was swinging so much before the anchor snubbed her around each time shows that on each swing, she was actually dragging the single anchor that she was sitting on and only snubbed around when she'd dragged so far that the second anchor could take some of the load. Nevertheless, eventually the crew did realise she was dragging and got the engine started in time to do something about it. Unfortunately, this is when misunderstandings of regulations and authority came into play. Although a pilot is required for ordinary manoeuvring, there are actually no regulations preventing the master of a vessel from getting underway in an emergency. 
Nevertheless, VTS still told the vessel, make sure you do not raise your anchors. Maneuver with your engines to stay safe, but do not raise your anchors. Do not raise your anchors, wait for a pilot. In reality, the master should have begun heaving on the anchors as they prevented the vessel from maneuvering and recovering the situation. The VTS communication may have come across as a direct order, but the legislation in force actually would not have prevented the nomadic milled from raising her anchors given the emergency of the situation. Finally, after the collision, when things seemed to have settled down a bit, it all went wrong again when they tried to separate the vessels. The large tug manoeuvring onto Nomadic Mild's port bow probably reduced the friction between the two vessels, allowing the Mild to start moving ahead. Then, the vibrations and alarms were most probably a result of the Nomadic Mild's propeller getting caught up in anchor chains as she slid forward on the Atlantic Venus, damaging her propeller pitch control resulting in her increasing speed and eventually striking the dock. I'm not sure that the sequence of events during the separation could have been foreseen, but with the benefit of hindsight, we can say that if you ever find yourself in that situation in the future, be aware of the effect of tugs manoeuvring so close to vessels that are entangled as the movement of water could lead to their separation. And if you are entangled after an anchor dragging scenario, be aware of the chains in the water as they could easily end up in someone's propellers. As with all of these investigations, they're not done to attribute blame. They're simply done to share the lessons learned when things go wrong, in the hope that we can all prevent the same things from happening in the future.